Good morning. Welcome to Freedom Church, Sunday morning, December the 6th, 2020. The year's nearly over, and we're looking toward Christmas over the course of these next several days. You know, I'm not uh, smart enough to figure out why God does what he does, but I was so impressed this morning when I looked at, my, at the uh, address of my quiet time because uh, this morning I spent some time in the book of Galatians where the Apostle Paul gives us some information about the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Recognizing that Paul wrote Galatians as a prison epistle sometime in the 60s A.D., uh, certainly 30 plus years after the death of our Lord and Savior, death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But in the context of the book of Galatians, chapter 4, he made this statement. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because we are sons and daughters of Christ, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son, the Holy Spirit, into our hearts so that we are now able to cry out, Abba, Father. So as I looked at that passage of Scripture this morning and thought about our dealing in the context of the prophecies related to the incarnation of Christ, the, the coming of Christ His first time on this earth, I began to think about that passage of Scripture. And um, Paul, under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, declares to us that when Christ came, He came at the exact moment of God's will. He came at the perfect moment in history. The verb there in that first phrase is in the past tense as well. And it talks about that in the fullness of time. So that fullness word there carries with it the idea of completion. A fulfilling of the time, if you will. And so you will remember, and we looked at... Um, the book of Micah last week, and we talked about Christ being born in Bethlehem, and that um, when the fullness of time had come, and you would understand that between Malachi and the book of Matthew, that there were about 400 years that elapsed during that time. And so from the time of the writing in Micah chapter 5 verse 2 where it talks about him being born in Bethlehem and that which we're going to look at today that comes out of Isaiah chapter 7, we would recognize that a lot of things took place. And not only did a lot of things take place between 750 B.C. and um, the beginning of the first century A.D. is that... Um, the northern kingdom fell in 722 B.C. The southern kingdom fell in 586 B.C. The children of Judah, who had been scattered abroad and gone into Babylon, were after 70 years able to come back to the land of promise, and then God didn't speak. For a period of 400 years, God did not speak to the children of Israel. And then as we begin to read in the book of Matthew, we discover that uh, the angel Gabriel had an encounter with Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, in the holy place, in the most holy place of the temple. And there in that place, he told him that Elizabeth was going to become pregnant and that they were going to have a child, and his name was going to be John. And John was going to be the forerunner of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll remember in that story that, that Zacharias um, doubted, and so the angel declared to him, Gabriel declared to him, that he would not be able to speak until the child was born and named. And so we see 
Zechariah and his encounter with Gabriel, and then we read on in both Matthew and Luke's gospel and discover that um, Gabriel, who had been in the presence of God, came and spoke to Mary, who is the mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so over that period of time, we recognize that um, the children of Israel had gone through a lot of things and that, uh, that God came at the perfect moment in time. And that Almighty God sent forth His Son. And so God did something extraordinary in sending His Son to this earth. This word sent forth in the Greek carries with it the idea of a person who is qualified in rank. Therefore, Christ was qualified to do what God had ordained for him to do. He certainly subordinated himself to Almighty God and came to this earth, born of a virgin, laid in a manger, and lived a sinless life for you and me. The Word of God said he was born of a woman, born under the law, recognizing that uh, he was subject to the law or was under subordination to the law because all mankind was subordinate unto the law of Moses. And that verse 5 says that he came so that he might redeem us who were under the law. So recognizing that every man, woman, boy, and girl has been born under the law, Jesus Christ came so that he might redeem those who have been born under the law. That means his redemption is available to every man, woman, boy, and girl who's ever lived on planet Earth, and that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is able, through that sacrifice for sin that Christ made, he is able to save to the uttermost anyone who will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. So he came to redeem. The word redeem there carries with it the idea of to rescue or to buy. And he bought us with his precious blood that was shed on Calvary so that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters of God. And so we who know Christ as our personal Lord and Savior have received uh, that certificate of adoption. And we have been adopted into the family of God. And we are now children of God in the family of God and a part of the kingdom of God as well. And that God so loved us that not only did Jesus come and die for us, and when we place our faith and trust in Him, verse 6 in Galatians 4 declares to us that because we are sons and daughters of God, that God has sent forth His Spirit, called in Galatians for the Spirit of His Son, into our hearts. And so, when we come to know Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we receive the Holy Spirit as a part or a down payment, as we've talked about from Ephesians, of the inheritance that we have in Christ. And having received that inheritance, we now, according to what Paul declares to us here in Galatians 4, verse 6, we are now able to call God what a glorious blessing it is to know as we move our way into the Christmas season that we're not just exchanging presents on Christmas Day, that we are the recipients of the most glorious present we could ever have, which is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf, so that through that work we might become children of God and be able to call God Father. And if you are able to call God Father this morning you need to understand the significance of that familial relationship that we have with God that was made available to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we celebrate in this day and celebrate in these days the incarnation of the Son of God, that we are reminded 
that Christ came to die. That Christ came so that we might be redeemed. And that we who comprise Freedom Church might be a people of influence in our community and in our world as well. And that others might come to know Christ because we have so been an example of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives that others will want to have that which we have. Now, I apologize for getting carried away there, but I, I just when I begin to think about this and think about what Christ has done for us, it just excites me and that uh, I recognize the significance of that which he's done and that we today need to be aware of that which he's done for us and aware of that which he has done for others as well. One of the traditions at our home during this Christmas season is that on Christmas morning, we get up, and my wife has made a birthday cake, and we have a birthday cake for Jesus in our home. And we sing happy birthday to Jesus on Christmas morning because he is the reason for the season, and he is the reason that we have eternal life, and he is the reason that we are redeemed, him giving his precious blood for us on Calvary's cross. And we need to live a life of faithful gratitude to Him in all that we do. Let me share with you this morning some prayer requests. Uh, over the course of the last several days, I've talked to some of our senior adults and had an opportunity to, uh, to find out some things that I need to share with you this morning. I talked to Miss Helen Rice this week. She was uh, taking... Um, physical therapy, not too long ago, a week and a half ago or so, and broke her pelvis again in the midst of doing physical therapy. And in my conversation with her on the telephone just in the last several days, she said she was in intense pain and that the medicine that they've given her has not been able to eradicate that pain. So I would ask you, interceding on Miss Helen's behalf, that you might pray for her and pray that God might eradicate that pain, that he might just do a supernatural work in her life so that she might not be in pain all the time. And you know what she still wants to go and do, and, and she's just driven that way? She said the only time she can get any relief is when she lays down. And uh, she doesn't want to lay down and just give up. She wants to continue to go and do and, and be a part of things. And so I would ask today that you would pray especially for her in the midst of these days and in the midst of that situation. I would also ask that you would pray for uh, Brother Will and Miss Jerry in these days as they've made that transition, that we would continue to lift them up because they are still a part of our family here at Freedom Church and that they are in the midst of a difficult transition at best. And it would be difficult for any of us to have to move like that or need to move in that situation and go to another physical location and purchase a home and do all those things that are associated with that. So I would just ask that you would remember Will and Jerry and their praying over the course of these days and that uh, they might sense a newfound presence of God in their lives because their family at Freedom was praying specifically for them. I've also this week been thinking about Miss Susie Hayes and recognizing that this will be her first Christmas without Dennis. And uh, I'm sure she must be uh, devastated at that fact. And I would just ask that you would pray for Miss Susie in these days, that she might feel the presence of Almighty God in the midst of this new season of her life as well as she seeks to continue to walk with God and walk in this world without her earthly companion, Dennis. And so I would ask that you would 
continue to pray for her. You would pray for our shut-ins. You would pray for our church family as well. I would also ask that you would pray for those missionaries that we are uh, ministering with and to by providing uh, monies for them. Uh, we received four new newsletters this week from the Sherwoods in Panama, from um, those in Japan, the Trills in Thailand, and the Taylors in Honduras. So let me just ask you to be praying for them as well. Pray for our ministry to Cuba, recognizing that uh, Brother Larry has a desire to go, and yet uh, because of the travel restrictions, he's not able to do that. I would just ask that you would pray that God would open those doors, that he might be able to go and do that which God has called him to do, and that we might be able to do ministry to those there in Cuba, recognizing that they are economically deprived, recognizing that they don't have the food that they need uh, on a regular basis, and that even in the midst of this pandemic, as bad as things may seem to us, they are far worse in many other places on this planet. So please, please pray for them as well. As we think about uh, uh, COVID-19, we recognize that there's a vaccine on the horizon, and that's wonderful news to think about. And yet, uh, we need to be praying as the people of God about how it's going to be distributed. And that um, those who are in charge might have wisdom and knowledge and understanding about how that needs to take place. And that those who desperately need that vaccine can get it first. Certainly those health care providers who are frontline folks, we should be praying for them. We should be praying for those who are uh, in hospitals in these days, who are on ventilators and other things as well, that uh, they might get that vaccine just as quickly as is humanly possible. And then finally, I would ask that you would pray for the body of Christ. Pray for the, the church in this place, for Freedom Church, that we would operate in safety and security as we do what God has called us to do. And as we continue to do this ministry where you're not here, but you're with us by way of this internet connection. And we so much appreciate the opportunity to be able to function this way. I'm so thankful for Brother Kenny and for what he does as it relates to getting us up and online on a regular basis. It is such a blessing that we're able to do this. And lots of people aren't. They just don't have the capacity to do what we're doing. And that God has been so faithful to us in these days. And that you have been faithful to our Heavenly Father as well. And that you continue to give your tithes and your offerings here in this place. Let me pray for us this morning. Uh, Father God, we love you today. Lord, as we think of those whose names have been mentioned this morning, we recognize that there are those who have significant needs round about us. And we would ask that you would minister to them as only you can do in the midst of their difficulty. I pray for Miss Helen. Ask your blessing on her this morning. Pray that you would bring healing to her body, the restoration of health, and that she might be able to continue to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ in her life. I pray for Will and Jerry this morning. Ask your blessing upon them. Pray that you would minister unto them in a very special and powerful way that they might feel your presence in their lives in a, just an overwhelming kind of way. I pray for Miss Susie today, Lord. I pray that you would walk with her in the midst of these days, that you would continue to be her hope in the midst of this new season without Dennis. May you bless her with your presence in all that you do. Father, thank you that you've called Freedom Church out to be a part of these missionaries who are scattered throughout the earth and seeking to do ministry for you. 
and that you have so graciously allowed us to participate in those ministries where they are. We are so very grateful for that opportunity. Thank you for including us in being a part of that worldwide ministry and those ministries plural. Father, thank you for the opportunity for us to be involved in ministry in Cuba. Father, I pray that you give Brother Larry patience in the midst of these days. I know he wants to go so bad. I just ask that you would watch over him and protect him. Keep him safe from any harm. Give him patience in the midst of these days so that he might be able to accomplish those tasks that you have laid before him. And Father, when we think of that ministry, we think of all of those churches there who are seeking to function in the midst of a pandemic in very difficult times and situations there. We ask your blessing upon them. Watch over them and protect them. Keep them safe in the midst of these days. Minister life to them so that they might be not only the receivers of your life, but that they might share your life with those round about them. Now, Father, today I pray that you would focus our attention on Isaiah chapter 7 and that your Holy Spirit would reveal to us the truths from this passage of Scripture so that we might be able to go away from this place today saying it's been good to be in God's house. It's been good to be with God's people. It's been good for us to interact with your holy, inerrant, authoritative word. So lead us through this time. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray. Amen. If you have your Bible this morning, we're going to look today at the second prophecy concerning the incarnation of the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And so we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 7, and specifically we're going to look at verses 10 through 14. And that you would understand that in those five verses... That in verses 10 and 11, we see God speaking to King Ahaz, who is the king of the southern kingdom, Judah. And then in verse 12, we see Ahaz's response to that which God has asked him about. And then the third primary thing we find in this passage of Scripture is that God gives not only Israel there in about 735 B.C. this picture of the Messiah who is to come, but that he gives us this prophecy as well. So that as we look in retrospect at what God has done, we realize that um, Isaiah was on the scene about the same approximate time as Micah, and that Micah told us that the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem, which is about six miles south of Jerusalem, in a small, out-of-the-way sort of place. And that Christ was born in a lowly cave that was a stable, and that he was laid in a manger or a feeding trough, for animals after he was born, and that we are reminded that Christ came for the lowest of the low, and for everyone who has ever been born, he gave his life for our sins. And so now as we move our way into Isaiah chapter 7, First of all, what we need to discover as we think about this particular passage of Scripture and look at the prophecy that we read about here in verse 14 is that we must understand contextually what was going on there in Isaiah's time as we get to Isaiah chapter 7. And so the time frame, as I declared, is about 735 B.C. And you will remember that the children of the northern kingdom Israel 
were taken captive by the Assyrians in 722 B.C., and that they were forced to leave the land of promise, and they have never returned to the land even to this day. And so, not too long after this prophecy took place, we find Assyria, that great superpower to the north of Israel and Judah, coming and taking the northern kingdom captive and carrying them away into exile. So, as we think about that time frame, we understand that there were three small tribal states in that area. First and foremost of all, the most northerly of those three tribal states was, As was Syria. Not Assyria, but Syria. The country Syria basically is what we're talking about when we talk about Syria in the time of Isaiah. And so Syria is also called Aram, A-R-A-M, in the scripture as well. And that Syria and Israel, Israel being the, the second of the three, and then Judah being the third of the three small tribal states or countries that were on the scene during that time. But they were living in the shadow of that superpower Assyria. And so the lives of those three small countries, those three tribal areas were lives that were lived in fear on a daily basis. Because the fear was that, that Assyria was going to turn her attention from other places, looking to the south and seeking to take the land that comprised those three countries for her own. And so we get to verse 1 of chapter 7, and we discovered here, and we're given the names of the three kings of those three places in geographic succession there on the Mediterranean Sea. And so the Bible says, chapter 7, verse 1, Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah. So Ahaz was the king of Judah, which was the southernmost of the three tribes, or the three countries, if you will, king of Judah. And that reason is the king of Syria. Reason, king of Syria. And Pekah, the son of Remliai, king of Israel. So the king of Syria... Reason and the king of Israel, Pekah, came together and formed an alliance. And they formed an alliance so that if Assyria came against them, they would not be just one small army, they would be able to take people from both Syria and from the northern kingdom Israel and come together to have a more formidable fighting foe against that great superpower Assyria. So in order to bolster their strength more than what they were as just Syria and Israel, they ask Ahaz, who was the king of Judah, if he would be interested and willing to come into an alliance with those other kingdoms so that they might have a, a larger army when Assyria came against them. And so... Ahaz said, no, he was not interested in being part of that alliance. And so the end of verse 1 of chapter 7 declares to us that, talking about Syria 
and Israel, Reason and Pekah, they went up to Jerusalem to make war against Jerusalem because Ahaz had chosen not to align himself with those two countries. But it could not prevail. But that army of Judah, or excuse me, the army of Israel and the army of Syria could not prevail against Jerusalem. But what they did do was that they set up a siege round about Jerusalem, there in that place. And because they set up a siege around Jerusalem, we have verse 2 that speaks to us about the fear of Judah in the midst of Pekah and reason coming against Jerusalem and the children of Judea. So look what verse 2 says. And it was told to the house of David, saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. So his heart and the heart of his people were moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. So in essence, what Isaiah is saying to them and to us in the midst of verse 2 here is that they were scared and that their fear had so overcome them that they were swaying as a tree would sway in the wind. That great fear had come upon them because these two nations had come against them. And so it is at this time, as we begin to move through this passage, that Isaiah the prophet comes on the scene. And so as we begin to look in verse 3, we see what Isaiah says. Then the Lord says to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and Shergesub your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. So God told Isaiah to go to a specific place, and there in that specific place he might meet Ahaz, the king of Judah. Now you will remember as well that the, when the northern and southern kingdoms, when Israel and Judah split and they became two distinct kingdoms that Jeroboam the son of Nebat became the king of the northern kingdom Israel and there were no good kings in Israel and that David's son Rehoboam became king in the southern kingdom. So the house of David, the line of Christ, was through the southern kingdom, Judah. So look what it says here. And say to him, so God says to Isaiah, say these things to him, take heed and be quiet. Do not fear or be faint-hearted for these two stubs of smoking firebrands. God calls Syria and God calls Israel two stubs of smoking firebrands. So he is discounting their power. He is discounting that which they had done to Judah. For the fierce anger of reason and Syria and the son of Remli, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remli had prophet or have prodded evil against you, saying, Let us go up against you. Judah and trouble it and let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves. And so if they made a gap in the wall they would be able to breach the wall of the city and be able to take the city for themselves. And then their goal was to set a king over them. And so God knew exactly what Syria 
and what Israel wanted to do to Judah. And so as we look at these verses, we recognize that Judah is fearful of what's taking place. God tells Isaiah to say to King Ahaz, just be patient, you're in safety with me, nothing is going to happen to you. So this is what God says beginning at the end of verse 7 and running into verse 8 and 9. It shall not stand, talking about this coalition against you, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken, so that it will not be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remliah's son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. So he is declaring to Ahaz that if he will believe, he will be established, but if he makes the choice not to believe, then he will not, and the southern kingdom Judah will not be established as well. And so what we know is, that it wasn't the Assyrian army that destroyed Judah and sent them into exile, but it was the Babylonians who did that thing to them. So when we get to verse 10, we recognize here that God is speaking directly to the lintage of David speaking directly to Judah and King Ahaz. So look what this passage says to us. Let me read verse 10 and 11, and then we'll walk our way through the remainder of this as well. Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God, Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. And so we see here in this word that God calls on Ahaz to ask God for anything that he needs. And that God is wanting to do something in the life of Judah so that they might recognize that God is their king and that God is taking care of their needs. So the question is, ask a sign for yourself from the Lord. Ask either in depth or the height above. Here is Judah surrounded by her enemies. There's a siege against Jerusalem. Things are bad there. Things are catastrophic for Judah. And they're afraid that Syria and Israel are going to breach the wall of the city of Jerusalem and they're going to be taken captive by Pekah and reason the kings of those two nations. And God in this passage is declaring his faithfulness to the southern kingdom, Judah. And he is calling on the king to ask for a sign from God. A sign from the heavens, a sign from the earth, Whatever he would like, God is making himself available to Ahaz and to Judah to receive that sign from God. Because God has been faithful and will continue to be faithful and give strength to those who function in obedience unto the will of God. Look at verse 12. Notice what it says. 
But Ahaz said, look what he does. God said, ask anything and it shall be given to you. What do you want, Ahaz? What would you like to see God do for you in this day? And look how pious Ahaz is in his response to God. But Ahaz says, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. So at first reading, just reading that on a surface kind of singular verse, it would look like Ahaz was a man of great faith and that he did not see the need for having God to intervene on behalf of him and on behalf of the children of Judah. But when we understand the context and we understand the situation in which they are in, it turns out that Ahaz was not a man of faith after all. Because had he been a man of faith, he would have asked God for deliverance for the children of Judah there in that place at that point in time. Nor was Ahaz a strong leader because what we see in what he says there in verse 12 is that in time of crisis, he capitulated. He looked around him and looked at his circumstances, and he believed in his heart that God could not take care of the situation that he found himself in and that Judah found themselves in. So Ahaz allowed the world to influence his thinking at this moment. and He was not motivated by God to participate in receiving from God that which they needed so that they might be delivered but he was more interested in political expediency. And so what happened was that Ahaz sought to make an alliance with Assyria instead of with God because they were the superpower. They were that group of people that could take care of them in the midst of that day. And so instead of looking to God as his deliverer, he looked at the superpower Assyria to be his power. So God had said to him, what does he say there in, um, in verse 11, ask a sign for yourself. And then as we make our way into verses 13 and 14, we see in verse 13 the rebuke of God on the house of David and on Judah as well. And then we see that magnificent prophecy that God gives about the coming of the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one there in verse 14. So look what he says in verse 13. Then he said, Hear now, O house of David, it is a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary God also? And so, in effect, God is declaring his greatness over mankind because he was the creator of mankind and that he is asking Ahaz about his wearying of men 
and his wearying of God as well because of his unwillingness to hear God and to respond to the directive from God to ask for a sign so that God might be his deliverer in that day. And that prompts God, not that God needed any prompting, but because of the disobedience of the southern kingdom, Judah and their unwillingness to allow God to be their deliverer, God then declares in verse 14. Notice how it begins. Therefore, or because of these things, based upon what has been said up to this point, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. So because Ahaz was unwilling to ask for a sign, God declares, I have a sign I will give you. So look what he says here. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So we see this idea of a sign. And the purpose of a sign is to draw attention. We have a sign outside of this building. It's not who we are, but it is a sign that draws attention so that people driving along the North Bypass might recognize that there are a group of believers that meet in that building. And so God was providing a sign not only for Judah, but for the entire world, if you will, that he was going to bring about something absolutely and completely miraculous. So a sign draws attention. And a sign also from God proves that God will do what he wills. Because what we know is that before the foundation of the earth, that God worked out a plan of salvation, and that he made the decision to bring into this world the incarnate Son of God. And so Jesus chose by a definitive act of his will to subordinate himself unto his Father so that God's perfect will might be done. So this sign that he provides for us is a definite signal, and it would have been a definite signal for them as well. It was a beacon. It was a monument, something that points to a, di to a deeper truth of God doing a work in the life of of a people, namely that God was intervening in human history in a different kind of way, not just through prophets, not just through priests, but through His Son. He was intervening in the lives of mankind whereby that Son, the Savior of the world, might live a life of example for mankind so that we might see how we are to be subordinate unto Almighty God by looking at the subordination of the Son. And so we recognize that God is at work accomplishing what He intends in every situation. And as we look at this passage, we recognize that this is not the normal manner in which pregnancies come about, is it? And the Word of God says that the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. So the birth of this son was to take place after what we would consider to be an impossible pregnancy. 
virgin was an unmarried woman who had not had sexual relations. And so what we see in this is that God will do all that he purposes and nothing can stay the hand of God. And so when you and I celebrate Christmas, one of the things that we need to be reminded of in the midst of that celebration is that God is a good God. But not only is God a good God, God is an all-powerful God as well. And that he did something in bringing about this sign that was completely beyond what people could get their heads around and understand fully. And we see that in the midst of the church trying to figure out uh, how, how Christ could be 100% God and be 100% man when he came in his incarnation. And yet we understand by faith that that's what the Word of God says. And that's what theologians call the hypostatic union, whereby... Um, Jesus was 100% God, and he had um, the, the nature of God in him 100%, and had the nature of man within him 100% as well. But an unfallen man, not a fallen man. So we see here that the word of God declares, Behold, I give you a sign, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And so... This son that was born by this virgin came to dwell among us. So that through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, he might set right that which is wrong. He might show us the way to God the Father. He might so live a sinless life that we might look at his life and recognize that he did for us what we could not do for ourselves in giving himself on that old rugged cross. So God intervening in history at that perfect moment in time, as Galatians 4 tells us, that his intervention in history changed everything. Did it not? Changed the way we can think. Was, gave us the ability to be transformed into a new creature in Christ Jesus. And so what we see here is that approximately 700 years after Isaiah spoke these words, a teenage girl came to Bethlehem, betrothed to her husband Joseph, preparing to give birth to a child that came forth from God. And so, the angel Gabriel told Mary that she was going to be that human vehicle whereby the Messiah would come. That God was going to use her to bring the Christ child into the world. And so, Christ came. He was Emmanuel. The Word of God calls him that here in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And we understand that word Emmanuel to mean, as Matthew chapter 1 tells us, God with us. But it's a little stronger than that in the Greek. It literally carries with it the idea that the Strong God is with us. 
And so we see Christ coming. And we recognize that 700 years before his birth, God used Isaiah as a mouthpiece to declare this second prophecy so that we might see how significant his coming was. So that we might be reminded of this sign that God gave us that the Messiah was to come. And that not only was he going to come, he did come. And that the Messiah, when he came, lived his life in complete obedience unto Almighty God. And then presented himself, as 1 John says, as the propitiation for our sins. That is to say that he presented himself as the sacrifice for our sin and that his blood was poured out on the ground there at Calvary as it came out of his body so that his life was given for our sin. Not only your sin and my sin, His blood has the potential for cleansing the sin of every man, woman, boy, and girl who's ever been born on planet Earth. And so he gave himself for all mankind so that through his death, burial, and resurrection, man might be brought back into relationship with God, and not only relationship, but fellowship with God as well. So what does that mean for us today? Well, first and foremost, it means to us that when we celebrate Christmas, we need to think in terms of the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who came to die in our place. And that God brought that baby to us as a grace gift from himself. So that through the birth of that child and the life of that child, we might understand not only the character of God. Because you remember Jesus said, Thomas said, show us the Father. And Jesus said, he who hath seen me hath seen the Father. So if you want to know what the Father's will is, look to Jesus. If you want to to understand what God would have us to do as a people here in this place, look to the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can see those things. So we need to trust him with all our problems. We need to trust him in all that he asks us to do because he will never ask us to do anything that we're incapable of doing under his leadership. And so as we celebrate Christmas, let us never forget that Jesus is the reason for the season. And that as we look to him, who is the author and finisher of our faith, we recognize that God has come in the flesh. And when he returned back to the Father, he dispatched his Holy Spirit to live amongst us and in us so that we can then make a difference where we have been planted. And so in this Christmas season, our lives should exhibit, our lives should manifest a measure of faith that is commensurate with what God has done for us. And that we as God's people might live our life as a people of faith. And that we might be like little children coming to God, believing that he can do what he says he can do, and then calling on him to do that in our 
so God has given us this prophecy as a counter prophecy or a counter sign from that which he asked Ahaz that Ahaz sought to divorce himself from outright that God then shared his sign which was the coming of the Messiah. So our celebration should remind us that God desires to walk with us. Emmanuel. God in the flesh on planet Earth and now as he's ascended back to the Father has sent his spirit to minister to us and through us as well. So my prayer for you today would be that you think in terms of the significance of that which we're celebrating, the significance of that which God did for us in bringing the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. To, yes, be that babe born in a manger. But to remember as well that God gave his very best to us so that we might be heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your blessed holy word. We thank you that you have given us not only the prophecy in Micah, but have given us this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7. And that we can understand Christmas in a new and profound way. Because in your grace, and in your mercy, you sent your Son to be the Messiah the anointed one who gave his life for the sin of all mankind. So, Father, in these days, give us eyes of faith to see your world in a new and profound way and make us a transformed people to seek to bring about transformation in a lost and dying world. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Let me just say to you this morning that if you have questions or concerns about uh, this message or eternal life, let me encourage you to communicate with us here at Freedom Church. Um, we have a web page and a Facebook page as well, and we would certainly encourage you to go to either of those and that you can communicate with us through them and that uh, we can then respond to your needs as it relates to uh, your asking those questions uh, as it relates not only to this passage of Scripture but to your understanding of what the Word says about someone coming to know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior or um, your needing to get back into fellowship with God in the midst of these days. So our web address is www.freedomchurch.us and I encourage you to go there and to communicate with us if you have a need this morning as well. Kenny, do we have birthdays? Amen. Daniel Rogers. Well, happy birthday, Daniel. We certainly appreciate you, my dear brother. And uh, we'll be thinking about you this week and as you... Uh, have your birthday, that God would bless you and use you in a mighty way in these particular days. Uh, by way of announcement, let me just say to you this morning that um, we have these beautiful Christmas decorations up here, and I thank Miss Sharon Melton for taking care of that for us, and um, it certainly sets the tone for the season that we are in in these days. Let me also remind you of the Lottie Moon Christmas offering that if you normally give to Lottie Moon, you can speak to Brother Marty or to me, and we will see that you get an envelope and can um, 
uh, put your offering in that envelope, and it can be designated that way in these days. Also, let me remind you that if, uh, if you uh, are generally giving to the body of Christ and to this church specifically, that uh, I would encourage you, you can do that online on our, on our uh, webpage. Uh, if you'd like to do that, or you can communicate with Donnie, or, or excuse me, with Marty or myself, and we would be glad to, to help you uh, be able to do that. And you can just uh, take care of your tithes and your offerings in that particular way. Um, any other announcements, guys? Anything else? Amen. Okay, thank you. Amen. Thank you, Marty. So we'll take the uh, Christmas offering probably through January, just so that we'll have an opportunity perhaps to come back into this place and worship as well, and that we would be able to do that also. Well, let's pray together and we'll be dismissed. Father God, we love you and praise you. We honor you with our lives. We pray that you would take this word and plant it deep within us and that we might understand what you did in the incarnation of your Son, our Savior. Dismiss us now from this place. Use us as instruments of your righteousness in the midst of these days. Father, give us an extra measure of your patience as we're dealing with people who are in a hurry round about us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for taking care of us. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, I pray. Amen. God bless you.